Welcome back to Continuum Meditations Discusses. In my last video, I discussed the Strange New Worlds episode, Under the Cloak of War. In that consideration, I started off with some serious observations and questions about Dr. Joseph Mbinga, thereafter posing some broader observations about the implications of his character and others like him in the Star Trek universe. I'd like to continue that now focusing on other characters' interactions with the Klingon persona of the episode, Ambassador Doc Ra. I'd like to warn you that there will be spoilers in this video regarding the episode, so please take the time to, if you so choose, go back and watch the program before watching this video, or, if that doesn't matter, then we proceed on. When Ambassador Doc Ra first beams on board the Enterprise, it is my personal observation that he engages in a deliberate effort to psychologically disarm and make the crew feel at ease. He appears to us first as a wizened character sporting a walking cane and wearing sage-like robes. He calls formal Klingon names a mouthful and insists that he only be called by a shortened form of his own name in this case, Ra. He lauds Federation starships as being better aesthetically designed than even his own native Klingon vessels. He denigrates his own people, calling them a warmongering race limited by ideology. He behaves very amicably and friendly at the dinner later held in his honor, cracking jokes and being the life of the party. He shows admiration for Sun Tzu's The Art of War, a brilliant book of strategy which I highly recommend to all of your reading, by the way, and compares it to a Klingon strategic manuscript of similar ideas. In every manner imaginable, Doc Ra goes out of his way to appear as non-threatening and as non-Klingon as possible. And so, in my viewing of the episode, I in fact ask the same question Erica Ortegas hypothesized earlier in the program. Was he acting as a double agent for the Klingon Empire, one whose job was to infiltrate and subvert the Federation from the inside? Or was he, maybe, as some on the Enterprise crew hoped, the genuine article? We have seen, as Erica described it, examples of the long con before. In the Star Trek The Next Generation episode, Data's Day, the Vulcan Ambassador Tapel, an honored representative of the Federation diplomatic corps of the time, actually by the end of that episode, turned out to be a long-term, deep-cover Romulan spy who had infiltrated the Federation and transmitted its secrets back to the Romulan Empire for years a fact later confirmed by retired Starfleet Admiral Nora Satie in the drumhead. And so, I do not believe this question in relation to Ambassador Doc Ra to be without merit, for it is a common tool in the history of long-range strategic deception. Let's join Captain Pike around the dinner table now and extend the diplomatic olive branch to an infamous figure of war and bloodshed. Our guests include Commander Chen Riley, Mr. Spock, Dr. Mbinga, Nurse Chapel, Ensign Uhura, Lieutenant Ortegas, and Adolf Eichmann, one of Nazi dictator Adolf Hitler's most trusted men and one of the chief architects of the final solution which in time began the extermination of six million Jewish souls in World War II. But if this personality is too heinous for you to stomach at our diplomatic table, then let us instead break bread with a perhaps less insufferable character, Lavrenti Beria, one of Russian dictator Joseph Stalin's right-hand men and chief of the Soviet secret police then known as the NKVD, which also in time, was responsible for the death and suppression of millions of Soviet souls behind the Iron Curtain during the Cold War. I mention these two reviled devils of history because, in his own way, this is what Ambassador Doc Ra represents to the war veterans who are assembled around Captain Pike's table, who are compelled by order of Starfleet Command and the Federation Diplomatic Corps 
to play nice with, when it is clear that they would rather, as we might say in our day, put a bullet in his brain. And while all of the war vets sit uncomfortably in Doc Ra's company, squirming with vengeance at his very presence, it is Erica Ortegas who is the first to crack. Indeed, it is Erica who begins her inquest of Doc Ra by asking if the rumors of what he did to escape Jagal were true, which he does not deny. She again challenges him by asking if he remembers the Klingon battle cry of the war, Klingon Maktak Judge remain Klingon, and then immediately indicts him of being complicit in the death of her friends during the conflict. Erica can no longer hold back her visceral revulsion for the creature before her and leaps to her feet in protest. She is ordered to stand down by Executive Officer Chen Riley, but does not. Instead, Erica stands her ground, literally, until she can bear this play-acting no more. Doc Ra, of course, attempts to brush off the confrontation, saying that he is trying to atone for his past and provide healing to veterans like herself still scarred by the war, as if he is some type of guru come down from the mountains to impart his existential wisdom and principles of peace. But Erica does not buy this asininity, and storms from the room in disgust. Conveniently, it is here that a similarly agitated Nurse Chapel takes the out given by Erica's exit to get out also. She politely excuses herself to go after Erica and swiftly departs the captain's quarters. But before the good Nurse Chapel takes the off-ramp away from destination Doc Ra, she clearly exhibits her own form of PTSD in his presence. She stands far away from Doc Ra and the rest of her fellow officers, wishing to be nowhere near him. She fidgets and shakes nervously, and grips at her drink with fingers so tight she threatens to shatter the glass in two. She rebuffs Spock's attempts to console her while trying to make him understand that he cannot appreciate what she's been through, and that no amount of comforting on his part will ease her pain. And you know, while I'm at it, as a side note here, it is interesting to me to watch Spock in this episode behave more like the sympathetic, groveling boyfriend to Nurse Chapel than he has thus far behaved as a devoted fiancé toward Chapring this whole season. As he himself might say, fascinating. But when Chapel's display at the Doc Ra dinner is looked at under the microscope of her wartime experience, her own reaction to the Butcher of Jagal becomes very easy to understand. And when further seen in conjunction with her telling Mbinga to make those responsible for the massacre of non-combatant civilians on Jagal pay for their crimes, her impending whitewash of Doc Ra's death while on board the Enterprise also becomes much easier to understand for it mirrors her encouragement of Mbinga's coming actions on the moon, regardless of the fact that she herself took no active hand in the violence. In my century, we don't succumb to revenge. We have a more evolved sensibility. Bullsh! Lily's incredulous reply to Captain Picard's sanctimonious expression of moral superiority brings us back at last to the true deadly hand of this matter. When Ambassador Doc Ra enters sickbay, Dr. Mbinga's first reaction to seeing him is shocked incensement, followed by a severe panic attack, one so debilitating that he is forced to retreat to his private office, stumbling into his chair and clutching at his chest and being unable to catch his breath as he does. And yet, as we see, Mbinga does not hold Doc Ra's presence on the ship against him, at least not initially, and even promises his captain he will later attend the special dinner in Doc Ra's honor. He goes even further in his attempt at magnanimity and encourages Erica Ortegas to put aside her prejudices and join him in fellowshipping with the Klingon. But all this is put underfoot when, later, Mbinga tests Doc Ra by asking him how he escaped Jagal and if he truly earned the moniker by which he is known as the Butcher of Jagal. 
This is a test which Doc Ra ultimately fails, and which puts the quest for justice back into Dr. Mbinga's heart, and he confronts the charlatan with the truth when Doc Ra unexpectedly enters sickbay to follow up on his earlier proposal of he and Mbinga working together to, allegedly, advance Doc Ra's peace agenda. Yet when the true butcher of Jagal is revealed, Doc Ra stands astounded in disbelief that he was allowed to suffer the ignominy of being labeled a traitor to his own people, when all this time Mbinga knew and withheld the truth. He tells Mbinga, I am ashamed of my cowardice. But so he is ashamed of his cowardice, because in Klingon tradition, he is a deserter to run away from battle and kill his own men in the process. And realizing this, Dakra knows he has nowhere to go but into the waiting arms of the Federation. He cannot go home to the Empire. If he does, at best he is dishonored and his house disgraced. At worst, he is a dead man. But if the legend he has crafted around himself is shattered by the truth that Mbinga knows, then not only is his work cast asunder, but the new and secure life created from it is put to the sword as well. And so he begs Mbinga to become complicit in the lie. And so, when put into this light, it becomes easy to see why he wishes Mbinga to join him. For Dakra had much to lose in this context and thereafter his assertion that he is there to be a vessel for healing loses its strength. Mbinga, his heart still lit with the flame of justice, refuses Dakra's overture, and the fight we all wish to see more clearly ends with the sudden and unexpected death of a Federation ambassador. And here let me offer some clarity. Dakra was not an ambassador to the Federation. Doc Ra was an ambassador of the Federation, one who had defected from the Klingon Empire and whom, once the Empire learned of his death, if it in fact did, would probably have celebrated it with barrels of blood wine, given his hated status by most, if not all, Klingons. And so the question of why the Klingons did not launch an inquiry, much more a protest, at Doc Ra's demise is answered. But the mysterious circumstances surrounding the death of one of the Federation's most respected ambassadors still left many questions that the diplomatic corps and Starfleet Command should have asked in its wake. But there was no follow-up, and this I do count as most unrealistic indeed. When confronted by Captain Pike, Mbinga states clearly that Doc Ra was a war criminal knowingly sanctioned by the Federation to represent its interests, a man who should not have been held in such esteem, nor exalted to such an honor, but who instead should have suffered the shame and revulsion he so earned for his misdeeds. And so I return, full circle, to Captain Picard's observation at the start of this segment that petty revenge is an obsolete notion of the morally evolved and culturally enlightened 23rd century man, and was not in any way Mbinga's motivation. But if there was revenge involved, then it was not the impetus of personal satisfaction that drove Mbinga forward, but the vengeance of the murdered souls who cried out from their graves that justice be done upon Doc Ra for his crimes. And from this vantage point, Mbinga spoke forthrightly, and without apology, when he told Pike that he was glad Doc Ra was dead. Did he proceed from a superior sense of morality and justice? That, of course, is for each person to judge on their own. Let's wind things down now with a look at Captain Pike's response to Doc Ra and the war veteran's reactions to his being on the ship. At several instances in the show, it appeared that Captain Pike was so concerned about obeying Starfleet orders to make Doc Ra feel welcome that he virtually was oblivious to or ignored the angst of those Enterprise war veterans uncomfortable with Doc Ra being there. And though Pike went to his senior officers beforehand, to advise and receive their acceptance of Starfleet's request, he seemed far too invested in the idea of inclusion to remember to support his crew first. 
and when those veterans who could pretend no longer openly made their feelings known, Pike appeared conciliatory and embarrassed by their reactions rather than understanding, as he did when Ortegas let loose on Doc Ra in his quarters. Pike's first inclination was to apologize for her tantrum, as it were, and say nothing to either reprimand or back her up, even after his first officer told Erica to maintain discipline and stand down. Captain Pike is a thoughtful and discerning man, and his reaction to this flare-up should have been one that soberly but directly asked Doc Ra to give account for the accusations levied against him by Ortegas, for they represented not simply her feelings alone, but those of the many other unseen veterans whom she spoke for, both on the Enterprise and beyond, including the two other veterans gathered with her around the table. It took Commander Chen Riley finally warning Captain Pike privately that things were reaching a boiling point on his ship, and the longer that Doc Ross stayed, the worse things were going to get. Before then, Pike cast aside every sign that the pretense of goodwill was not going to hold while this reviled individual remained aboard. And even after Doc Ra was dead, and Pike spoke to Mbinga about it alone in sickbay, rather than acknowledging and debating the truths which Mbinga articulated, he seemed to mouth every platitude and cliché imaginable, as if he were some first-year philosophy student or seminarian in debate with one of his more learned professors. It was the kind of response one might expect from a freshman cadet at Starfleet Academy, not an experienced and perceptive Starfleet captain. It seems to me that we have in this captain a man strongly disinclined toward conflict and who actively seeks to avoid it, both professionally and personally. He is not a lion, but a fox, for where the lion believes in confrontation and directness, the fox believes in negotiation and maneuver, and of course, the sheep believes in surrender. Throughout this situation, Captain Pike behaved to me very much like a fox than a lion, and I was quite disappointed. I'll end this video by saying that I believe that Under the Cloak of War was actually one of the better episodes, perhaps even one of the best, of Star Trek Strange New Worlds, one which I enjoyed and will watch repeatedly in the future. The performance of Babs Olusan Mokun was first rate, and whatever one personally thinks about how he was developed, a standout moment of character expansion for Dr. Joseph Mbinga, one that, no doubt, Trekkies will continue to debate for years to come. That said, as always, I welcome your likes, shares, subscriptions, and thoughtful replies to my video. And until next time, Star Trek fans, live long and prosper.